Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you pay for something, I guess you work a little harder, you know. I met with him Thursday. Uh, I had asked him that question. He said he didn't know you. So I don't know. Just for the top. Did you take much of the accreditation? I said, I
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Jamie is working the polls. He's a poll worker for the election. He won't get out there until the last one votes. We're in Galatians. Now, if you're, if you're just first time here, the, the Apostle Paul is quite disturbed if you read the first chapter or second chapter about these, he calls them Judaizers, and you'll see the name on the board. The Judaizers were Jews from Jerusalem who, who said they were saved, Christians, but yet they, they believed you had to keep the law. And so thus when they came to the Galatian churches, they were poor, there were a bunch of churches in Galatia, it's not one church. But they came there and they started trying to convince the Gentiles, and that's what you and I are, that they needed to keep the law. Number one, the men had to be circumcised. And I'm against that. <laughs> We're taking a vote. <laughs> but but uh, so Paul, the first three chapters is, is uh, attacking these Judaizers and he's rebuking the Galatian Christians. Let's read verse 1 through verse 5. Look what he says right off the bat. Oh, foolish Galatians. You, you, you say that in the pulpit next week and see how long you last. <laughs> you call your church. You have to say, you bunch of fools out there. <laughs> yeah, you'd be hurting out there quick. They'll have, a, they'll have a deacon's meeting that afternoon. You'll be gone by nighttime. Oh, foolish Galatians. Look here. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Now he's saying this uh, in, in a... In a in a kind of a joking way. He's not going to learn from them. He's going to tell, he's going to tell them. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Verse 3. Are you so foolish? He's called them foolish twice. Mm. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. In the last verse, verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Amen. Let, let's look at verse 1 and 3 and look at the word foolish. <laughs> uh, if, you have a, if you have a moment, turn over to Matthew and see what Jesus says. In Matthew 5, 22, see what Jesus says uh, about that. It's a kind of a shocking thing. Uh, anybody find that, raise your hand, I'll have you read it. Matthew Brenda, read it real loud. Verse 22. This is Jesus speaking. I have to amplify. Uh, read it. Okay. But I say to you that everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice, which is enmity of heart, against him shall be liable to and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the court. And whoever speaks contemptuously and insultingly to his brother shall be liable to and unable to escape the punishment imposed by the Sanhedrin. And whoever says, you cursed fool, which means you empty-headed idiot, <laughs> shall, be shall be liable to and unable to escape. Boy, Amplified takes five hours to say one sentence. <laughs> one sentence. Basically, Jesus told them, if you call someone a fool, that you were in danger of what? Hell fire. Hell fire. Now, it's interesting to know you don't see it in the English, but you do in the Greek. The word that Jesus uses in Matthew 5, 22, if you want to write it down, 
It, it's a word where we get our English word, the Greek word is moros, where we get our English word moron. <laughs> Anybody home? Yes, sir. So when Jesus was using that word, he was saying, he was saying in very, very strict language, the word Paul uses is not the word for moron. Are you with me? He doesn't use the same Greek word. Now, it looks like in the English, he's using the same word. Jesus said to call somebody a fool. Paul calls them foolish. Two different words. Two different Greek words. Now, the word that Paul uses, now, the word that Jesus used was moron. <laughs> stupid. You know, there's a stupid factory putting out stupid people. One of my favorite comedians is, is the guy that gives people a sign. Here's your sign. Your stupid sign. People do dumb things. You know, you, you, you're parked along the road, your hood is up, guy stops and says, is there a problem? Your car broke down, you're like, what's going on? No, it's smoking, it's trying to quit. Hello? Here's your sign. But the fool that Paul talks about means senseless. Lack of understanding. Lack of good sense. So he's telling these people, that you're foolish because you don't understand what I preach to you, and now you're being bewitched. Now, bewitched is a powerful, powerful word. You know, a lot of people don't realize there are witches. There are witches. A, a few years ago, there was a there was a witch covenant up in Spring Hill. And matter of fact, I know that because they called me up, and they were going to get on to them. We had a witch got saved, and. Uh, and so the other witches got upset and they called me up and threatened us that uh, they were going to sprinkle dust on the parking lot of the church, you know. Bless their hearts. When you're covered by the blood, the devil cannot curse you. And, and the word here, bewitched, uh, in the culture of that day, that they believed that someone could give you the evil eye. The evil eye. That means that they can look into your eyes and, and literally what you would probably call today was hypnotizing them. And so, so he's talking about you've been tricked. You've been deceived. You're under some kind of spell. These Judaizers had overpowered their thinking. They started out right. They started out believing that Jesus died for them. He shed his blood for them. He was buried for them, he was resurrected for them, and that was the only means of salvation. The Judaizers had convinced them, you've got to keep the law. I told you last week, there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. And we even listed some of them last week, and boy, are they, some of them are crazy. You know, we, we talked about you don't eat pork, and we talked about you don't, you don't wear a fabric that has two blends in it. And about every fabric you're wearing right now has two blends in it. One of them is polyester, no doubt. And you, 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 all kinds, 613 laws, impossible. You want to write that down. Impossible to keep the law. You couldn't do it. The only thing the law did, according to the Bible, it was our schoolmaster. It was our teacher to lead us to Jesus. It shows us where we sin. But the Judaizers, they believe that a this is amazing. That they, they, these cultures of those days, and even today, you go to Haiti, and there's a lot of voodoo worship in Haiti, and people trying to put curses on other people. Well, in the culture of that day, they believed a person could cast a spell on someone by looking into their eyes. And, and if they did that, they controlled them. They controlled their thinking. They controlled... Uh, their, their, their ability to comprehend things. So he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? Who has deceived you? Who has overpowered your thinking and led you astray? Here's something I found out. Satan is a master at distracting us. You're, go you're, going, you're going great. You're, just having, you're having a half a day of a good day. And all of a sudden, something comes up, and you get distracted from the Savior to the situation. Yes, sir. You get distracted from a promise you've been claiming, 
until the problem you're now facing. He's a master at distracting us. Yes, sir. I mean, and I'm going to tell you something. We've got some preachers in the house, and we preachers sometimes are the worst. Yes, sir. Uh, if things are going great, who to do have a wonderful time, the anointing of God's on us, somebody just got healed, and then but we get an anonymous letter and boom down in the dumps. He's a distractor. Get a hold of that. Yes, you've, sir. Got, you've got the greatest gift that the church, we, you, me, the greatest gift of the spirit we need today is discernment. Yes, sir. We need to be able to discern is this of God or is this of the enemy? Even when people come, we need to be able to discern now, is, is, this, is this a blessing coming my way or is this a curse coming my way? Because you allow people into your life, they're either going to bless you or they're going to curse you. And, and what do you mean by that? Everyone you give access to to your life is either helping you, going toward God, or they're preventing you and pulling you away from God. Yes, sir. Anybody still home? Yes, sir. Don't, and this is, e this is easy for me to say this. It's another thing to do it. Don't get your eyes off of Jesus. Amen. Don't get your eyes, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. It's easy for us to say that. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's another thing to do that. Because life can throw you a curve at any second. Yes, sir. At any morning you get up, Something can happen that day that can change your whole life. Yes. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, the young ones don't, but the older ones do. You, 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 you have to be prayed up and you have to be read up. Stay focused. Stay focused, okay? The Galatian Christians had been fooled by these Judaizers. They had been literally duped, fooled, into believing that what was begun by the Holy Spirit could be completed now by fulfilling the Mosaic Law. And you cannot fulfill it. There's only one, his name is Jesus, who came and fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law. But how many times, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did the, the Pharisees accuse Jesus of breaking the law? Now let me tell you what law he was breaking. He wasn't breaking the written law he was breaking the oral law, the verbal law, that the Pharisees had added to the Scriptures. He fulfilled what his father had put down, didn't break one of them, but the oral laws he was breaking. How come your boys aren't washing their hands when they're eating that corn? And Jesus goes back and tells them about David, King David going into the temple, or actually it was the tabernacle at that time, and, and eating the shoe bread, which was only for the priests. So... Jesus is the only one that can keep the 613 laws. You can't do it. You can't do it. But what happens in the church, and you, you may have been in, is we become legalistic. We're, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I don't smoke. I don't, I don't smoke. I, I, I never got into smoking. Matter of fact, if I would have started smoking, my dad would have busted my bottom so. <laughs> I had a prevention there. And it wasn't my heavenly father. It was my earthly father. I've never been drunk in my life. Never been drunk in my life. Never been on drugs. But, but I'm going to tell you something. If, 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 if you smoke, I don't believe that will stop you from going to hell. If you smoke, I don't think it will stop you from going to heaven. Are you with me? You can smoke and go to hell. You can smoke and go to heaven. The difference is, when you go to heaven, you're going to smell like you've been to hell. I lost a few friends, actually. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, 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 but I know churches that, that you can't... I know a church that you can't be a member... Listen to me, if you smoke. You cannot be a member if you smoke. I don't think that's, I don't think that's right. You can't be a member if you're not saved. That's the only criteria. Amen. Amen. That's the only criteria. And and so and, and there's churches that, that have all kinds of rules and regulations. Uh, and, and if we're not careful, the rules and regulations will supersede the scriptures and it will put you in bondage. That's right. And I believe in living a holy life. Say amen. Amen. 
See, the, the, the Judaizers were, they were saying this basic thing. The finished work of Jesus on the cross was insignificant. It was not able to save you completely. Right. It was insufficient right. to save you. That's a lie of the devil. Amen. It's a lie of the devil. The, the, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. Yes. And only what Jesus did on the cross can you be saved. Yes. Has anyone failed since you've been saved? Yes. Has anyone sinned since you've been saved? Yes. Okay. Now, now, that, now the, the problem is... You, you, you don't want to stay in habitual sin. First John 1 9 says, If you sin, you have an advocate. If you confess that sin, Jesus Christ will forgive you of that sin. But I'm going to tell you, when people stay in habitual sin, falling in the same hole time after time after time, whoa, whoa. If your temptation is a bar, change your route home. Amen. No, if, if, if there are certain things that tempt you, then, then if the internet is a temptation to you, get off the internet. Amen. Hello. Come on. I'm not kidding. If, there, if there's, you say, well, I, I, I want to be strong. Well, let me tell you that some of the great things they do is remove temptation from you. There you go. Remove temptation from you, and then that's a key. Paul is rebuking. Ooh, what? I wouldn't want to be rebuked by Paul. Paul is rebuking these Galatians for departing from the gospel of grace. You're saved. Not because you earned it, deserved it, or merited it. You're saved because God's grace is sufficient. He saves us when we don't deserve to be saved. He saves us when we haven't earned to be saved. You can't earn salvation. Amen. Amen. If, you get a, if, if you're called to preach and you get to preach, you're not going to earn heaven because you preach. Right. You had the privilege of doing something for Jesus. If, if, you, if you're teaching a class or if you're, if you're just praying for someone, you have the privilege of doing that. Virginia and I went to visit uh, Sister Edna Freimeyer. Some of you do, don't know this precious old saint. She's in her nursing home. Uh, when I was at Marinette, she was a hat lady. She always wore a hat. I want to tell you, now she's an odd lady. <laughs> now, you ought to be preaching. You ought to be preaching Christmas time. Christmas time. She would wear... <laughs> She would wear a small Christmas tree on her head that blinked on and off. And I'm not preaching and here head enough. Then I would try not to look where she was sitting. And I can imagine what a visitor was thinking seeing this woman with a Christmas tree on her head blinking on and off. But, but Virginia Ruth and I went, went to visit her uh, Monday. And... Uh, what happens to people when, and her mind comes and goes, and she, she, she knew me, she had passed her right, and then she went down the past trail, you know, to remind them. But, but I, th I was thinking, here's an, here's an old time saying that, that most people in the church have forgotten. And, and I didn't get a brownie point by going and visiting her. We didn't get a, we didn't get a notch getting better than going to heaven. We just had the privilege of blessing one of God's children. That, that's what being a Christian is all about. Amen? Amen? It's not earning anything from God. It's just being a blessing to people. And if you lead someone to Jesus, you've really blessed them. Amen? Amen. Oh, you've really blessed them. Praise Amen. God. We are justified. Justified means counted as righteous. Just as though you never sinned. How could that be? All of us have sinned. God chooses to remember your sins no more. Amen. God knows your past and your future and your present. And when he says in Jeremiah that, that I remember your sins no more, he chooses not to remember. If the devil, if the devil is at your trial and you face God at the white throne judgment, and the devil brings up your sins that you've committed, and he is very very aware of every sin we've ever committed. God the Father is going to say, if you've been washed in the blood of His Son Jesus, I don't know what sins you're talking about, but that'll get you to glad heaven once or twice. Amen. 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 I, I, listen to me. If you ever get anything out of, out of our Bible studies, it's all about Jesus. That's right. It's not about being a Baptist, a Methodist, a, a, it's not about being a Pentecostal, it's all about, it's all about Jesus. He 
did it all, and he deserves all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. Because he's the only one worthy. Amen. I said he's the only one worthy. So we are justified through faith in the finished work of Jesus. But Brother Wright, we need to do this over here. We are justified by the finished work of Jesus. Someone, someone the other day told me they were worried about me. They were concerned about me. About my doctrines. And I said, what are you talking about? Well, we, we've heard you talking about grace a lot. But man, my Lord, my God, we're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. Do what? Faith. And so I challenged them. I said, now, go back over your last year's preaching and see how many times you preached on grace. But if you're not preaching on grace every once in a while, I think you're missing the target. Because it, I tell you, it's, it's God's grace that you get to heaven. When, when I face God, and I, and I want to tell you, I've got less days ahead than I've already spent on this planet. When I face God, there's only one way I'm going to make it into heaven. And that's through the grace of God Almighty, through the blood of Jesus Christ, my Lord. And the same thing for you. Well, I've been faithful to the church for 125 years. It won't get you to heaven. Because many at that day will say, well, Lord, didn't we do this for you? And didn't we do that for you? And Jesus says this in the scriptures. I never knew you. And the word know there means I never recognized what you were doing. Wow. Isn't that amazing? You're not going to get to heaven because you prophesied, and I believe in prophecy. Or you cast out demons. You're going to get there to God's grace. Can, can, we make, can we make much about that? Well, look here, Paul. We're in the third chapter of one book, and he's been talking about the whole time. Go through Romans and under. I did this well back. Read the book of Romans, and every time you see the word grace, mark it. Go through the book of Romans, and every time you see the word grace written down, mark it. I'm going to tell you, you're going to find out that Paul talks a lot about God's grace. Paul was a murderer. He murdered the church. He murdered Christians. Threw them in jail. Paul calls himself the chief of all sinners. And he's the chief of all sinners. Well, how's he going to make it to heaven? God's grace. I said God's grace. You see a word in verse 1, crucified. Crucified. Do you see that? Crucified. Now, look, look at that word just for a moment. It says, it says here, clearly, you betray among you as cru crucified there. Jesus is no longer on the cross. The Catholics believe, and, and everywhere you go in the Catholic Church, you'll see a, 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 a cross with Jesus on the cross. The cross is empty. Not only is the cross empty, the tomb is empty. Right now, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, interceding, praying for me and you. Hallelujah. The, the word crucified here literally means the crucified one. The crucified one. It's talking about Jesus. The there were hundreds and thousands of Christians that were crucified on crosses by the Romans. But when it talks about the crucified one, we know it's talking about Jesus. The cross is empty, but now listen, this is a mystery. The cross is empty, but the marks, the scars, are still on the body of Jesus even after he was resurrected. Well, where, where do you get that? Well, you get that from, from the Gospels where he comes into a room through the wall after the resurrection. And, and Thomas said, well, I'll never believe unless I thrust my hand into his side. And Jesus appears to him and says, go ahead, Thomas. He says, As a matter of fact, put your hand right in my side. That means the stars are there right now. As a young, as a young preacher, I wonder, well, why, well why, why? Because every one of our loved ones and, and ourselves, they're not going to be old. They're not going to be crippled. They're not going to be blind. They're not going to be Amen. ate up with cancer. They're going to be completely whole. And young, matter of fact, one great preacher, Robert Morgan, said that he believed the age of heaven is 33. Yes. Wow. 
I'll take care of that man. I'm revoking my man. I claim it. But yet Jesus has scars. He has marks on his body that, that he received as he was whipped and nailed to the cross. I believe that when you and I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, I believe that any time you've purchased something, you, you may, if you get stopped at the, at the door of Walmart or Kmart and some security guard says, D did you buy that? And you said yes. And they say, well, you show me the receipt. You have to pull the receipt out of the bag or out of your pocketbook or out of your pocket and show them to prove to them that you have purchased this item. I believe that Jesus Christ shows the Father his wounds to tell the Father, here's the receipts they've been paid for. Amen. You mark that down. I, that, that, that'll go to the bank. Yes, sir. That's the only reason I believe that he still has the, the, the marks because you and I have been paid for and the receipt is the scars yes. on the body of our Lord and Savior. Th these are the symbols of the victory of the cross. Colossians says that Jesus made an open show of the enemy. When did he do that? When he died on the cross. Paid for our sin. The devil made a, made a horrible mistake when he lifted Jesus up. Yes, he did. Because Jesus had already said, if they lift me up, and he was talking about the cross. He wasn't talking about your preaching. He wasn't talking about your witnessing. The literal scripture, when he said, if I be lifted up, he was talking about the cross. When he's lifted up, he said, I'll draw all men to myself. The cross is a moral magnet. The cross is God's mountain of mercy. Well, these boys write these down and you preach it. Yes. Crazy missing names. The cross is God's altar of atonement. It's all about the wonderful price that Christ paid on the cross. God saves people by His grace and not on the grounds of human achievement. He said, well, boy, they're a great Christian. What do you mean by that? Well, they, they, they do a lot of good stuff. But well, that's great. But the only one that's great is Jesus. Amen. The rest of us are all on that's level right. ground. Amen. Right, the Judaizers were turning these new converts, these Gentile Christians in Galatia, from the cross. The Judaizers were pulling them from the cross, the finished work of Jesus, and they were they were putting Jewish legalism on them. See, remember these Gentiles, number one, were not circumcised. The Gentile men were not circumcised. So these Judaizers were saying, you boys have been saved, you really aren't completely saved because you've got to get you got to get circumcised. And then circumcision would lead to everything else. You've got, you got to observe the Sabbath day. You've got, you got, you got to wear a prayer shawl. You've got to go on and on and on and on and on. And it's impossible to keep it. It's impossible to keep it. So Paul's upset. Paul's amazed that they missed the clear preaching of the cross. Now, there's a word, uh, if you have a King James, there's a word in that first verse that says, set forth. Set forth. His preaching set forth the crucified one. And that word set forth uh, in, in the New King James, it's clearly portrayed is the word. Well, in the King James set forth, it's, it's a posting of an official notice on, uh, in a public place. It's like Paul was displaying the message of the cross on billboards. All over the area of Galatia, where everyone could see him, it was clear as can be, and Paul's mystified, how come I preach it so clearly to you, and you've already been bewitched and are leaving you? Let me tell you something. I've seen people radically say, miraculously say, I mean from a witch, a drug addicts, drunks. I've seen, I've seen people radically say, I need to tell you radically say excited about Jesus, testifying about Jesus, and then I've seen him turn and go away. I'm mystified. I, I, as a preacher of the gospel, I'm saying, what, 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 why would they want to go back to the thing that, that, that was bondage to them, that controlled them? I, 
I mean, when you get on drugs, it, it, you, 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 you don't make right decisions. When you're drinking the, the alcohol, any time that your will, look here, any time you do anything that brings your will down, demons can come in. Demons cannot possess someone that's filled. That's right. What happens is, you remember the Lord told the parable, the story about the, the man that was delivered from demonic spirits, and the demon fled. Yes. Remember, and they traveled over dry land. That's something you ought to write down. They traveled over dry land. And, and then it says they came back and found the man's house clean but empty. And guess what they did? They went in this time, how much worse? Seven, Seven times. So, so you not only want to get cleansed, you want to get filled. I want to get filled. And uh, I just, my heart aches when I see people turn and go back to their old life. I, I just, I say, why would you do that? that I'll, I'll be honest with you. I just want to grab them. I, I, I just want to shake them real good. I want to take my belt off. No, I ain't got it. But you just have to love them. Pray for them. But Paul, is, he, he's asking the question. How did you get bewitched so quickly when I was clearly preaching the word to you uh, and it was like a billboard? Now, have you ever heard somebody preach and you had no idea what they said? Yes, sir. Yes. Come on, talk to me. Yeah. They use gigantic words. And I, I, some of the greatest compliments I've ever had as a preacher is... People have come to me and said, I understood what you said. Yes, it was simple. You, you, but sometimes, Michael, they, 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 they try to impress people with their degrees. I have three degrees. I have a bachelor, I have a master's, I have a doctor. But I want, I want it to be so simple that, that, that someone who is not the smartest tool or the sharpest tool in the shed understands what I'm saying. We need to make it simple. Amen? Amen. Number two, the Judaizers had told the people, now listen to this. And you look at verse two there for a minute. Uh, verse two, uh, uh, Paul, Paul says, I, I want to learn from you. Did, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or, or, or uh, by faith? Now, this is what the Judaizers believed. In my studies, I found this too. The Judaizers had told these, these Gentile Christians that the Holy Spirit was only poured out the moment they were circumcised according to the law. There you go. Ah, that's, what, that's, what, that's why Paul said that in verse 2. These Judaizers, these, these, these people that were leading the Christians astray, they said, they said, now when you get circumcised, that's when God pours out His Spirit on you because you've kept the law. You know what I told them? I'm cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll go another route. Do you see the deception? I'll tell you about the UPC church. Some in the UPC church believe that when you're baptized, that's when you get filled with the Holy Ghost. You should come up out of the water speaking in tongues. That's not scriptural. In the scriptures, people were filled with the Holy Spirit before they were baptized, after they were baptized. See, God always mixes them up. You remember when Jesus stuck his fingers in a guy's ears and said, be open? I'm shocked there's, there's not a church called the, the Fingers in the Ear Church. <laughs> Find how many times Jesus did the same thing twice. One time he spit in a guy's eyes. One time, oh, Jesus didn't want us to get locked in to a certain way of doing things. He wanted us to get locked into the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. That's right. Oh, my, my, my. Look at the lie that they were telling. They, they, they had locked in that you, Jesus, well, he pretty much saved you, but to get the Spirit, you've got to be circumcised. Now, I don't know what the women had to do. I guess you just got, you just got called in when the men got circumcised. <laughs> I'm not going to imagine the guy's getting circumcised. They're on the couch for three months soaking it in. Can I have a sandwich? Could you give me something to drink? Come on, somebody. 
I hear Virginia in the back saying, Amen. Hey, <laughs> I've worked this shoulder, I've worked this shoulder. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. That was a mistake. That was a mistake. That was a mistake. Oh, Lord have mercy. The Judaizers believed that everything about salvation was based on works. It was a, it was a works-based gospel. Verse 2, salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit, not keeping of the law. Now I want you to turn to Romans, if you have a Bible, turn to Romans 8 9. A person, now you got to listen to what I'm saying. A person is not saved unless the Holy Spirit is living inside of them. Now I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the second work of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But salvation is not a work separate from the Holy Spirit. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. Amen. Number one, the Holy Spirit draws you. Number, number two, the Holy Spirit convicts you. And, and, and it's not a, listen to me, being saved is not a fleshly birth. Peter says in John 3, 3, it's a spiritual birth. And the only way you can be spiritually born again is the working of the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? Yeah. See, when you're, when you're saved, the Holy Spirit takes residence inside of you. When, when you get baptized, it's, 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 you're, you're, you're filled with power. It's actually, it's a release of power. And also, it, it releases gifts into you and also... Is, is the way that the Holy Spirit begins to lead you. When you get saved, He'll start talking to you, but when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're on a different plane of being led, guided, and directed of the Holy Ghost. So Romans 8 9, look at it clearly if you've got a script Bible in front of you. Romans 8 9. Now, Brother Bill, do you have it? Read it real loud. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Did you hear that? So you can't be saved without the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God. You know when Jesus said, we're two or three gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in our midst. Well, the Holy Spirit's in our midst when two or three gather together because we're two or three gathered together, we, we have the Holy Spirit within us. Within us. There, there's more power when you have an assembly of saved people than there is when you're by yourself. Amen. Now when you're by yourself, God's with you and you're reading the word. But when you get two or three together, because one can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand, three, if you do the same math, can chase a hundred thousand, four can chase a million. It just tells you that there's power when you get together. And, and people say, well, you know, I don't need to go to church. Well, the devil can isolate you from the body of Christ. He'll beat you up. Amen. God doesn't want you isolated. He wants you to come together because there's power. There's great power. Strong. It's, it's a release of, of might when you get together as a team and you're not fussing and fighting and arguing and debating and murmuring, complaining. Every preacher that I know of would love to go through a week without some church member complaining and murmuring and grumbling and griping. I'm so glad I'm an evangelist. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> so remember, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence within you. Verse 3, he's talking about maturity. He uses the word verse 3, perfect. Well, as I look over the crowd, <laughs> nobody here perfect, including me. This word perfect here means mature. Mature. We want you. You can be you can be eighty and be immature. Amen. You can be in the church for up ten years and still be a baby Christian. Maturity takes growth. It takes. It's a process. It's you're progressing. Uh, it, it's it's not meaning you're getting more of Jesus. I hear this a lot. Oh, I want more of Jesus. I want more of Jesus. You got all of Jesus you needed when you got saved. What 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 the Lord really is, is He wants more of you. <laughs> Yeah, that's nothing to do with more of Jesus is that he didn't have more of you. He was, oh, I'm a hot after God. Well, God's hot after you. He wants more of you. He wants to occupy all of you. Are you still here? Yeah, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a misnomer going on, and I hear it a lot. 
there, there's an excitement, there's, a, there's an energy going on, and, and we're, we're seeking more of God. You really need to reverse that. You need to realize that we need to allow God to have more of us. John the Baptist said, less of me, more of Him. More of Him. More of your time. More of your energy. More of your focus. More of your thoughts. Christ-like maturity is not a work of the law. You don't get mature. You don't grow in Christ by keeping the law. A bunch of rules and regulations. You, you, you mature in Christ. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. He's working. He's working with the Word. Christian life is continually responding to the guidance and the direction of the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I just wonder how many are really hearing the, the Holy Spirit. Of course, He can talk. And, and it's like when my father told me to do something, if I didn't do it, He didn't kick me out of the family, but He taught me, son, when I tell you to do something, I expect you to do it. Are you with me? Yes. I mean, I had to do certain things not to be paid. I didn't know what allowance was. I, I, I never thought, why are you paying somebody to be a member of the family? Yeah. I, was, I was eating his food. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Wearing clothes that he paid for. Yeah. Sleeping in a bed that he bought. Yeah. And if dad said, okay, son, uh, on Mondays you carry the garbage out. Well... Number one, I better hear him. Number two, I better respond to him. Because he had wonderful ways of enforcing the fact that he wanted the garden. Is anybody here in the house? Yes. Maturity comes when we quickly obey the Holy Spirit. Now, you can become fanatical. I know people, crazy people do stupid things. I, I often thought that I pastored a bunch of granola flakes, fruit flakes and nuts, I'm telling you. I've had people come up to me. I've had people come up to me and start rattling off something that they said the Holy Ghost told them. And after about 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, they, and they would say something like this. And you know what I mean. And I'm going, I don't have a flip of what you mean. I've been to Bible college. I've been, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't think anybody else knows where. I think you're an independent. I think you're the only one in your church. But they... they, they Holy Spirit doesn't make you wacky. He gives you wisdom beyond the wisdom of the world. He, he guides us. He leads us. You, you, you are saved, but you need now to learn to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, Brother Wright, I really don't know if that is the Holy Spirit. Okay, here's what you should do. Number one, check with the Word. Get in the Bible. Check with the Word. Number two, Check with those who you are spiritually submitted to, your, your leader, pastor, or whoever it is. Check with them to see, because everything should be confirmed with at least two or three witnesses. And there's nothing wrong with, with, with doing that. And uh, don't let people manipulate you. I've seen that. And here's how they do it. They prophesy over you. And they, they, their, their voice changes. Their voice gets deep and they begin to speak King James English. Thus says the Lord God Almighty, Thou art to write me a thousand dollar check. Thus say the Lord, Amen, Amen. What in the world? Hey, let, let me tell you something. I believe in prophecy. But, but here's the way, listen to me. Anytime someone prophesies over you, it should be confirming what you have already been dealt with by God. You hear me? Don't, don't get a hold of someone's prophecy when they come from way out yonder, start talking to you about stuff that you never, ever, ever considered. No, 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 no. The prophecy should be a confirmation about what God already is dealing with you about. Hey Amen. Amen. Yeah, I know a man came in at church. I was pastoring one time. I was gone. Uh, and, and he came in and took over the service and started prophesying. He told, he told one, he told one the man that was supposed to start a Christian school. Out of clear blue sky. And this guy quit his job and 
and tried to start a Christian school. Of course, it flopped, it failed, and they gave up to him. The town quit, and I don't know this day they're going to church. And if he'd asked me about that, I said, Brother, have you ever thought about starting a Christian school? No, I never have, never have, never have. Well, then don't do it. Don't go because some hairy duck comes in that you don't know. Number one, if you prophesy to me, I better know you. Yeah, I, I ain't getting nothing from some, some stranger coming in from off the street and going to prophesy over me. No, 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 no. I had a lady one time tell me years ago that I needed to leave Maranatha. Leave Maranatha, you need to leave. Thus said the Lord our God that I leave Maranatha and fellowship. And told me I was supposed to go back and get more education. Then I was going to have a worldwide ministry. You know? So I said, well, I'm going to check that out with the men that I'm submitted to. And I knew it wasn't of God. And the men I'm submitted to said it wasn't of God. And that person that did that, they left the church. Because they were trying to get me out so they could... Uh, uh, don't let people manipulate you. Don't you do it now. And it can be done easily. It can be done easily. And manipulate. I've been in services where they do get up and say there's a hundred of you going to give a thousand dollars and there's ten of you going... I don't believe in that stuff. I if, God, if God tells you to do that, you do it. You don't need somebody up there telling you that there's 10 of you going to do such and such. That's crazy. Yes, I've had a service one time because I've gone to all kinds of meetings. I mean, I've gone to, I've gone to, the, to the white ones. I just, just, to, just to see if there were some real ones around. And one guy, one guy, he was going to pray for sick people, but, but, but they had come down and give so much money. And one little poor lady went down there and didn't have no money, and they just kind of shrugged her off. Well, I just prayed for her in the, in the act. I never charge anybody for praying. Where do you get someone charging someone for praying for you? There's one guy on TV. He's on early in the morning. He charges, I think it's $89.99 for prophecies. No, it's the truth. He's up in New York. He's called Prophet Jordan. And, and, and he charges, I think it's $89.99 for, 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 for a prophecy. You send in your money and I'll send you a prophet. What? Let, let me tell you what kind of prophet that is. Money. You already? That's a false prophet. That's a, that's a con man waiting to try to get your money. Trying to pick your pocket. How do I get on that? I don't know, but I'm having a time. <laughs> Maturity, mature people don't get sucked up in that stuff. The life of every Christian is a life of trust. People will fail you. Jesus will not fail you. These Galatians had been deceived into thinking that spiritual growth, becoming mature, could only be accomplished by keeping the law. No. It can only be accomplished through the Holy Ghost. Verse 4, you see suffering. Suffering. Do you know the Bible says that all those that will live godly in Christ Jesus will have a great time? Never have a burden. Never have a bad day. No. They'll suffer persecution. And these saints had been persecuted by Gentiles and by Jews. If you'll if you write this down, Acts the 14 chapter, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 19. Acts 14, verse 2, verse 5, and verse 19. It tells of the persecution that these Galatians had. I'll, 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 read, I'll read to you. Chapter 14, book of Acts. Verse number 2 is what it says. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. And the brethren were the Galatians, and guess what? They attacked. Verse 5. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone the Christians, Aren't you glad we live here? We still have some freedom. Amen. How many of you believe the church? How many of you believe that Christianity is under attack? Well, oh, I do. You tell me the last time a sitcom on TV made fun of Islam or Muhammad. Tell me the last time that a newscaster made some slight remark about Muhammad. But you listen to how many sitcoms make fun of Jesus. I want to tell you something. I, by God's grace. I, 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 I'm trying to see people say it. But brother, they, they, they blasted Tim Tebow in the, in, in the National Football League for being a crime. I mean, they ate him up. And now they're making so much because a 
gay football player got picked the last one of the last one of the last one, and then he turned and kissed his partner. And I want to tell you what. We are being conditioned to accept sin. And when we don't accept it, you're, you're intolerant. You're an intolerant Christian. All you Christians are a bunch of fanatics. Well, I guess I am. Because I believe that, that God can deliver you from that. But in the scriptures, it's called abomination. Two mighty cities were completely annihilated because of that. And then read Romans, the second chapter, and you'll find out Paul preaches about it. Help me somebody. If we take a stand today, we're going to suffer some persecution. Now, just because I'm against homosexuality doesn't mean that I hate homosexuality. See, that's, people say, well, you hate all homosexuality. No, 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 no. No, I've, I've preached to homosexuals. I've had them in the crowd. I've had them come up and shake my hand and say, boy, you really preached. And I'm going, man, I must be getting weak. <laughs> Physical suffering is what Paul was talking about. But persecution can come in many forms. Mentally, emotionally, the enemy can get you stirred up. People come against you. Verse 4, if now they had forgotten what it was like to trust Jesus for salvation and turn to trusting the law to save them. Paul says in verse 4, your, your first trusting Jesus is now useless. It's in vain. What do you say? If you turn from trusting Jesus to trying to keep a bunch of rules and regulations, he said your, your, your trust in Jesus in the beginning was, was, was in vain. It's in vain. It was empty. Now some people say, well, they really never got saved. Paul doesn't say that. Paul didn't say you never got saved. He just said what you believed in the beginning, you've now turned from it. And now you believe you've got, to be, you've got to be legalistic. And he said if you believe you've got to be legalistic, he said you, you, your first beliefs, they're in vain. Verse 5. Who supplied the miracles that went on in the Galatian churches? Miracles were happening. Does anybody believe God still does miracles? Yes. Well, he's asking a question. Who did these miracles in your church? Was it done by the Holy Ghost or was it done by keeping a bunch of rules and regulations of the law? That's why he asked the question. Was it the law or was it the Holy Ghost? Miracles of healings, miracles of signs and wonders, miracles of gifts of the Spirit. I want to tell you, when you're operating in the gifts of the Spirit, brother, it'll shake people up. Oh, and and, and it'll, it'll shake people up when God reveals to you things in people that they only they knew. And see, the Holy Spirit, He knows all about us. And so he asked the question, who, who, who did this? Was the Holy Ghost or was it keeping the law? Now Hebrews 11, 6 says that without faith, no one can please God because you must believe that God is, present tense, and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The only way miracles were happening in that church was through faith in Jesus. Turn to Mark 11. We're going to wrap it up, but we're going to be here just a few minutes. Mark 11, let's look at faith just one moment. Look at verse 22 of Mark 11 chapter. Say amen when you arrive there. Amen. I can hear them over the internet saying amen. amen. <laughs> that really gives. Amen. Verse 22, Jesus says, have faith in who? God. God. You have, your faith has to have a foundation. I've heard preachers on TV say you need to have faith in your faith. That's crazy. Your faith isn't your foundation. God is your foundation. You must, you must believe that God can do anything. That God can do the impossible. You've got to put your faith in a God that can still work miracles. Your faith will rise no higher than your belief in God. If you don't believe God does miracles anymore, then what's the issue for asking miracles? Preachers are telling people that God doesn't do miracles anymore. The miracles are over. I'm going to leave that church and ask for my money back when I leave. Because I believe that you're going to need the miracles. Anyone ever needed a miracle? Yes. Well, guess what? You're going to need one before you die. Yes. We, we need miracles. And so you have to have faith in God. Now he tells you something mystery. He says, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, your faith can talk. And your mountain can be any problem you're facing. 
be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt. That's the key. Doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Verse 24, therefore, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them before they're manifested. Believe that you receive them and you'll have them. The problem is we pray, we ask for something, but between the time we ask for it and the waiting period, oh, I hate waiting periods, the waiting period, the devil talks us out of it. Well, you'll never get to that. That's crazy. Nobody got that kind of stuff. But that's that's crazy. He'll talk you out of it. You've got to pray. You've got to believe that you're going to receive it, but by faith, you've got to believe that you've got it right now before it's manifested. That's crazy. No, it's faith. Tell somebody you've got something and you don't have it yet manifested, and they'll say, you, you've lost your mind. I knew, I knew going down to those Tuesday night Bible studies, you were going to lose your mind. You're going to church too much. You've got, you've got to believe that you have it right now in the spirit realm before you ever get it in the physical realm. Miracles happen when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. You remember the man at the gate called Beautiful in Acts, the third chapter? And, and, and they ran, and when they found out the man was healed, they, they started worshiping Peter and John. And Peter and John said, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. This miracle happened through the power that's in the name of Jesus. So there's power in his name. Man. When you're in a trouble, when you're in a situation, here's this. Here's this. I'm going to give you. Speak the name of Jesus out loud. Amen. If you're facing a problem, write it down and say, Jesus. Right over. Because God highly exalted Jesus and gave Jesus a name over it. Every other name in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That means you can speak the name of Jesus over any situation. Yes, sir. How does faith come? Well, number one, God's given us all a measure of faith. We all have a measure of faith. But that measure of faith can be increased high. By right here, Romans 10, 17, look at it. We're going to close with this one. Maybe. I don't know for sure. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh. Everybody say cometh. Look, someone's coming. That's the same thing. When they come, that means they've arrived. And so when he said faith cometh, that means faith shows up. When does it show up? When the word is being preached, spoken, because faith comes by hearing. Faith shows up when you hear the word. Now, most time when you're in the Bible study, you're thinking about something else. So you're not hearing. Someone's coming. And, and, and as that person comes, guess what? Faith shows up when the word's being preached. And they've arrived. I told you they were coming. And they've arrived. How long did I tell you? I told you they were coming. Did I not tell you they were coming? See, I told you they were coming. And when they came, you all went, wow, he's right. You should have believed me when I said it before it showed up. Faith will show up. Faith will come when the word is being preached. When you're under the anointed man or woman of God, you need to say, faith's coming, faith's coming, faith's coming, faith. And it comes through your hearing. Not through your sight, through your hearing. I'm telling you that God, God can do anything. Amen. But faith. But we've got to have faith that God can do anything. Jesus Christ is just the same today. I, I've heard people say this so many times. You know, I hardly ever let people testify. Forgive me. You know why? Because I got sick and tired of hearing them talk about the dog that got run over and the hot water tank that got blew up and, and the husband got drunk last night and ran off. And then they would say this, would you all pray for me that I'll hold out to the end? That wasn't a testimony. You've been bragging on the devil for the last 20 minutes. Listen to me. Someone says, uh, pray for Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie's got cancer. So everybody in the church prays for Uncle Charlie. Two weeks later, Aunt Susie comes to, to, to church, jumps up, so excited. And this is the first word to come out of Aunt Susie's mouth. Are you with me? Listen. You all are going to believe this. Hello? Hello? Did you hear what she said? You all aren't going to believe this. And then she goes and tells us that he got healed and the doctor can't find cancer. And Excuse me! Don't you tell me I'm not going to believe it. I the one pray for it. Do you see how dumb we are in the church and preachers let that happen? Well, let me tell you, when I was pastor in Manhattan, years ago, they started that stuff, I'd say, 
stop. Number one, I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. So you quit telling me I'm not going to believe what you're getting ready to say. Amen. Come on. I call that inflation my money and brain money. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing how many times we think we're testifying, but we're complaining about what we're going through. <laughs> Testimony is a victory report. So bottom line, bottom line, five verses in Galatians. Is it keeping the law or is it faith in Jesus? It's faith in Jesus. Is it, is it, let me tell you something. The law never performed one miracle. Amen. Come on. If you and I were living in that day, there were no miracles happening in the synagogues unless Jesus was Amen. in the synagogue. Now when he showed up, withered hands were healed. Yes. Being over women were healed. Yeah. And guess what? Guess what all the religious folk in the synagogue said when Jesus healed them in the synagogue? You're not supposed to heal people on the Sabbath day. So they jumped on him that miracles finally showed up in their churches. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I want miracles to show up in their I said, I want, I want God just to break loose and just start healing people all over the house. Amen? Praise God. Gently, gently, gently just touch someone beside you and pray for God to make them whole, make them well. Come on, open your mouth up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray they'll be whole. I pray they'll be well. I pray they'll be healed. I pray, Lord, that which doctors cannot find the reason for. I pray, Father, you know all about it. I rebuke the devil. I rebuke disease. I rebuke inflictions. I speak the name of Jesus over this crowd of people. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, it'll work out. I pray the tricks and the lies of the devil. God, I pray those lies will be found out, rebuked, removed. I pray now that door that's been closed will open up. I pray right now, Lord, that situation, right now, I pray it will be solved in the name of Jesus. I pray the burden of it will be lifted by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. For the anointing of the Holy Ghost lifts burdens and destroys yokes of bondage. Lord, we don't want to be bound by the law. We want to be set free by the Holy Ghost. Lead us and guide us and tell us what to do. Father, one more time, I ask you to lead us and guide us and tell us what to do. And give us a heart that's quick to respond to everything the Holy Ghost tells us to do. Take away that reluctant spirit that will cause us to hesitate when the Holy Ghost moves on us. Help us to be quick responders to the moving and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Sanctify what we've learned tonight. And we pray that Judaizers will not be able to put bondage on us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Praise God. Thank you for coming. There's still plenty of food.